love. Thank you for grace, unmerited favor. Favor we don't deserve. Thank you for the blood of Jesus that covers and washes away our sin, and we are clean before you only because of that. Father, open our hearts and our minds now to your word. Help us to be centered and focused on you and you alone as we seek a deeper understanding of your truth and as we seek to grow in a deeper relationship with you. Fill us with your spirit so we can accomplish your purposes. And I thank you and praise you for what you're going to do in the lives of these that are here today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, this is our last week in the book of Genesis. And... At the Nicene Council, which took place in the 4th century, of the 318 delegates that were there, fewer than 12 of them, think about this, fewer than 12 of the 318 that were there had not lost an eye or lost a hand or walked with a limp and various other disabilities as a result of torture torture for their Christian faith. Suffering is a part of remaining true to the Christian faith. But I wonder, in comparison to this truth about the folks that were there, these 318 delegates, if we even have a perspective of the minimal suffering that, that you and I endure, we need to understand that our response to our circumstances in our lives, our response to those drives the way that we feel much more than the circumstances themselves. Our reaction to that drives how we feel. And so it's, it's really not our experiences in our life that determine our happiness or our peace. It's our reaction to them. So our goal today is to understand that God causes the circumstances of life in the grand scheme of God's sovereign plan to fulfill His purposes. God causes the circumstances of your in my life, and there's this umbrella of, of sovereignty that goes over His grand design from, from start to finish and on into eternity to bring these things about. But a side benefit of that that you and I get as believers, as He does this is he does it in order to shape you and I into the likeness of Christ. And so, to better understand what I'm talking about, if you'll turn with me to the final chapter in the book of Genesis, chapter 50, and I'll read, beginning in verse 1. I'm going to back up for a second to give us some, uh, some context. Jacob, Israel, has just given his blessings to all 12 of the tribes of Israel, all 12 of his sons. And immediately following that, soon after that, we read in the text that Israel has passed on to the next world. His life is over. And so in response to that, we read in verse 1 here in the text, Then Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. So physicians embalmed Israel. Forty days were required for it, and that is how many are required for embalming. And the Egyptians wept for him seventy days. And when the days of weeping for him were past, Joseph spoke to the household of Pharaoh, saying, If now I have found favor in your eyes, please speak in the ears of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, I'm about to die. In my tomb that I've hewn out for myself in the land of Canaan, there you shall bury me. Now, therefore, let me please go up and bury my father. Then I will return. And Pharaoh answered, Go up and bury your father as he made you swear. So Joseph went up to bury his father, and with him went all of the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his household, and all the elders of the land of Egypt, as well as all the household of Joseph, his brothers, and his father's household. Only their children, their flocks, and their herds were left in the land of Goshen. And there went up with him both chariots and horsemen. It was a very great company. When they came to the threshing floor of Athad, which is beyond the Jordan, 
They lamented there with a very great and grievous lamentation. And he made a mourning for his father seven days. When the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning on the threshold of Hattah, they said, This is a grievous mourning by the Egyptians. Therefore the place was named Abel Misraim. It is beyond the Jordan. Thus his sons did for him as he commanded them, for his sons carried him to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field of Machpelah, to the east of Mamre, which Abraham bought with the field from Ephron the Hittite to possess a burying place. After he buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt with his brothers and all who had gone up with him to bury his father. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, It may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph, saying, Your father gave us this command before he died. Say to Joseph, Please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin, because they did evil to you. And now, please forgive the transgression of the servants of God, your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear, I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. So Joseph remained in Egypt, and he and his father's house Joseph lived 110 years, and Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation. The children also of Machir, the son of Manasseh, were counted as Joseph's own. And Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died, being 110 years old. They embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. May God add his blessing to the reading of his book, Word. So here we have it. By releasing his brothers from their guilt and their fear, Joseph demonstrates his surrender to the sovereignty of God. You see, as we look at our text today, what we see is, in the beginning, there's the passing of Israel, and then immediately there's this reaction from the brothers. Well, you know, now that our father's dead, our father's not going to be able to protect us anymore, so we need to go to Joseph and we need to submit ourselves to him and make sure that he's okay and that he's not going to destroy us because he's in power. He's the ruler of all of the known world, and he is in a position to have them all wiped out, and there would be no one there would be no one that would say anything about it. But what we see here is that Joseph is practicing agape love towards his brothers. As we read over in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and many call it affectionately the love chapter, but there's one particular description of agape that applies to this text here, and it's this. Love does not take into account the wrong suffered. Love does not take into account the wrong suffered. And so as we look at the definite article that's listed there in the text, we realize that what's being spoken of is that there are things that have happened to people in the past, and agape, expressing agape, means that we don't consider those, and we don't hold them against people. And it's this idea of, of a ledger. It's an accounting term that's being used in the Greek. And so if you can imagine this ledger, and here in the ledger there are amounts that are listed there that are owed. And so what the text is telling us in there is that love does not put things in the ledger and keep account of them. And so that's what Joseph is doing. He's not taking into account the wrong suffer. And let's review what's happened here. Everybody that was in Joseph's life, all of his brothers, conspire against him, sell him into slavery, thinking they will never more see him again. And he becomes a slave, and he's in the house of Potiphar, and so he's working there in the house of Potiphar as a slave. Can you imagine? 
Everyone that you know, everyone who you hold dearly to you, conspire against you. And they do you dirt so bad that you are sold off into slavery. Can you see how Joseph could be justified in being bitter? Joseph could have been very bitter about that because he didn't deserve that. No one deserves that. Can you see how that could happen? And then, if that weren't enough, here we have Potiphar's wife who goes after him and, and tries to get him to sleep with her. And he says, I can't do this terrible thing to God. So he doesn't even think, oh, that's wrong. It's bad. He doesn't consider that. He considers what it would do to God. You see Joseph's heart. And so she lies, falsely accuses Joseph, and he gets in prison. If, if that's not enough, we're adding insult to injury here. Because we see that Joseph is now not only a slave, but now he's a prisoner. And he thinks he's got a way out because two of the chief officials in Pharaoh's household are now put into prison. And he knows one of them is going back, and he has the ear of Pharaoh. He's his advisor, and he thinks, I've got my way out. And he says, remember me, after he interprets the dream of the cupbearer, cupbearer, purposefully or not, forgets him for two years until opportunity presents itself. But if, if anyone, if anyone would be justified in being bitter about being dealt a raw hand, it's Joseph. But he doesn't. He perseveres, he always rises to the top, he gives his best, he does all to the glory of God wherever he is, and he rises to the top. And what we don't see until the end here, what Joseph didn't see until the end, is that God has been preparing him all along for the task that God had for him. And so as we, as we visit the text today, and we see what Joseph's response or his reaction of agape love is, it would be very easy for Joseph to say, hey, no problem, it all turned out for the good bit. So no big deal. But that's not what he says. That's not what he says. Let's keep going. For sure, though, that Joseph does not hold a grudge. Immediately his reaction is, you made it for evil, but God made it for good. He doesn't hold a grudge. Did you know, perhaps you do, people from Texas, that a rattlesnake often, when cornered, will actually bite itself. It gets so uptight and so stressed out that it bites itself. Did you know that? This is exactly what harboring unloving attitudes will do to you and I, my friends. If we hold that hate and resentment against others, it's like biting ourselves. ourselves. We think that we're harming others by, by holding these spites and, and these unloving attitudes toward them, but the deeper harm is to you and me. It just eats us alive, doesn't it? I read a story once. It goes like this. One day, two monks were walking along the road. They were going to a nearby village to help out to bring in the, in the crops. And as they were approaching the river, they spied an elderly woman who was sitting by the river's edge, weeping. And as they went over to find out what was, what was wrong, the, the elderly woman said, I, I'm, I'm trying to get to my destination before dark, and the bridge is out, and I have no way to get across. I'll be swept away by the, by the current if I try to cross. The first monk said, well, that's no problem. We'll, we'll, ha we'll happily carry you across, which they did. And so after they traversed the river and got her to the signal to the other side, they set her down. And they continued on their way toward the village. And as they walked along, the second monk said to the first monk, Look at my clothes. They're dirty. I'm soaking wet. I'm cold. All because we carried that woman across the river. And now my back's beginning to seize up on me. What a hassle. That was. The first monk just smiled and they continued on. After a little while further, the second monk griped again and he said, My back is hurting me so badly that I can barely walk. And it's all because we helped that woman across the river. And he laid down on the ground in agony. 
And the first monk looked down upon him, he smiled again, and he said, Do you know why I'm not in pain and why I'm not hurting? The second monk looked up and he said, I, I don't know. Perhaps you're stronger than me. And the first monk said, I set the woman down five miles ago, but you're still carrying her. <laughs> and you see, my friends, that's what it's like for you and I when we carry those unloving attitudes in the gun sack. It gets heavy. more and more go in there. See? That's what we are like when we deal with our family and our friends, you know. And we're kind of like the second monk. We just can't let go. We hold on. And in fact, we'll uh, perhaps from time to time remind those people in our lives of those infractions when we want to get the upper hand. But it would be just easier to just let go. So just getting back to, to our, our story with, with Joseph. Just like Joseph. You and I need to practice agape love in dealing with others. We need to practice love does not take into account the wrong suffering. And I want to, I want to, you might say to me, but pastor, you don't understand what they did. You don't understand what I've been through. You don't know my life. And that may be true. That may be very true. And in a court of law, you could be standing there before the judge, and you could, you could plead your case, and the judge would say, you were right, that was absolutely wrong. What they did was absolutely an infraction towards you in the worst way, in the worst degree. But you did just as wrong. and I are commanded to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength, and what? To love our neighbor as ourselves, our friends. And when that love is described, it's described in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7, and one of the qualities is that love does not take into account the wrong suffer, but another is love does not seek its own. And so, my friends, your response to the circumstances of life will make you feel terrible. We think that what has happened to us makes us feel this way, when in fact, it's our reaction to it that makes us feel that way. Because you see, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. And so we should feel these feelings all the time when we're controlled by the Spirit. But with our reaction of a lack of love, my friend, we will feel like the weight of the world is on our shoulders. All because of our response and our reaction. We need to keep perspective, like Joseph did, that God's plan and His purposes surpass your and my comfort. You know, sometimes we get the idea that, you know, because we're Jesus Jr., because we're a Christian, that life ought to be rosy, you know, and as, as long as we're giving quid pro quo to God and serving Him the way that we think, you hear that? The way that we think that we should, that He's going to make everything in our life rosy and everything's going to go great and everything seamlessly will just kind of flow right through life without any problems. But my friends, God is not a vending machine. You don't put your quarters in and punch A7 you get Cheetos, right? God is not a genie in a bottle. We get the idea that God is our minion. He's got all this power and everything. As long as we do everything that we think He is telling us to do, that we just rub the lamp and, you know, we grant grants our wishes. And that's a, a completely inaccurate depiction of God. Because you see, Joseph got it right. He realized that this umbrella of God's sovereignty transcends himself. If we, if we read the text, go back and look at this text. 
Go back and look at chapter 50, verse, verse 19. Let's look at that. Look at what it says. Verse 19 says, But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? Pause right there. Look at me. What is he saying? It's, it's, it's not my call. It's not my call. He's surrendering to the sovereignty of God and saying, God's in control here. It's his call. It's his call. Let's keep going. Am I in the place of God? He says, As for you, you meant evil against me. He is acknowledging that he knows that they wanted to do him dirt. They hated him badly enough to get rid of him and lie about it. Let's keep going. But God meant it for good. Now, he didn't stop there. If he had stopped there, what is he saying? Joseph is saying, if he stops there, hey man, it's all good. I turned out to be Pharaoh's number two guy. I'm in control of everything in the world now, so it's all good. But that's not what he's saying. Listen to what he says next. This is the purpose statement. Here it is. God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. My friends, Joseph got it right. It's not about you and me. It's not about you and my comfort. It's not about how things turn out for you and I. It's about God's sovereign plan. Joseph is saying... God's plan is bigger than you or me. And his plan was to bring me here for this time. He developed me through all of the struggles of my life to prepare me for his purposes so that many would be saved. Did you catch that? To develop him, insert you and me, to develop you and I for his purposes, so that many would be saved. You know, it's a very big struggle for us. And people will ask a question, and we watched the movie, Ar Archie showed us this, this weekend on, on Friday, where people ask the question, how could a good God allow evil? How could a good God allow these, these kind of things to happen? And you know, the Word of God is sufficient to solve all of life's problems, and there's an answer to that question. And if you'll turn with me to the New Testament, please grab your Bibles and turn with me to the New Testament, to the book of Romans. In the book of Romans, chapter 8, in a very familiar passage, Beginning in verse 28, many of us have this memorized, and I know we know, but I like us to look at the Word of God, particularly when we're revisiting something as important as this concept. Romans 8, 28 and 29 says this. It says, and we, who's we? That's you and me, believers. And we know, not that we can guess, not that we can kind of get an inkling, not that maybe we could be... No, it says, and we know that for those who love God, that's you and me, all, that's everything, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. Did you hear that? All things work together for good. It doesn't say all things are good, but it says that all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. That's you and me. That's believers. Because you see, it's the sovereignty of God and His purposes that are in play here. 29. For those he, whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, in order that, purpose statement, in order that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. Let's break that part. For those he, he foreknew, in other words, the people that are going to be believers, he knows who they are. He also determined that, that he's going to conform you and I into the image of his son so that he, Jesus, would be the firstborn among many brothers so that people will come to Christ 
as a result of what you and I look like. Everything happens in order to shape you into the likeness of Jesus Christ so that when the unbeliever sees you and, and me, they don't see you and me, they see Jesus Christ. And so, by the way that we live, by the very life, we are a living witness. And you've heard me call it many times, a contagious faith. You see? And so, my friends, think about the perspective of the sovereignty of God as it affects our circumstances. Because, you see, it could be very easy for you and I to make it about you and me. And when something doesn't go our way, when something really devastating happens to you, and there are some terrible things that happen to people in our lives, and to you and I personally, and it would be very easy for us to say, why are you doing this to me, God? It feels like you hate me. And that's a very introspective way to look at our faith, my friends. Because you see... What's being said in our text today, the one main point of today is this. It's not about you and me. You know, there's a song that goes like that. And it goes, it's all about you, Jesus. And all this is for you, for your glory and your fame. It's not about me. As if you should do things my way, you alone are God, and I surrender to your ways. Do you hear that? When we surrender to his ways, and when we get a perspective of the kingdom, my friends, the peace and the joy of the Lord becomes our strength, not what happens to you and me. We keep our eyes fixed on the purposes of God and our involvement in that. The joy of the Lord becomes our strength. Amen? So, what do we do if we're in that hole? <laughs> you say, well, that's true, Pastor Doug, but what if I'm in the hole and how do I dig my way out of the hole? You know, I've, I've given you part of the equation, and I, I, when I speak to you about these unloving responses that we have, when we've chosen to respond to our circumstances with a lack of love, what do I, what do, I do? How, how do I get out of that? Hopefully you've held your place there in Romans, but if you haven't, just turn back to Romans for quickly, and I want to read this passage. <coughs> because you see, when you and I respond to our circumstances with a lack of love, this is what happens. In Romans chapter 2, <clears throat> in verse 14 says this, For when Gentiles who do not have the law, that's the lost, when Gentiles do not have, who do not have the law, by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves even though they do not have the law. There are a lot of themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show the work of the law written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. So what does that say? That's, it. That's saying that Adam and Eve, when they, when they ate the fruit, the knowledge of good and evil, that was transposed to you and I in our DNA. We know when we've done wrong, and immediately, when we choose a lack of love, we're going to feel guilty. Even the unbeliever. Now, if we continue with that, and we don't do anything about that, then we're going to continue in that, and we will develop an anxiety. And in 1 John chapter 4, verse 17 and 18, it talks about fear. And it, the text tells us that there is no fear in love. You hear that? There's no fear, there's no anxiety in love. Because perfect love casts out anxiety. Because anxiety, fear, involves punishment. And the one who has anxiety or fear is not perfected in love. So as we're controlled by the Spirit, we will not feel anxious. So you see that? Response, a lack of love, guilt, 
anxiety, and if we don't do anything about it, the next thing is to flee. There are all kinds of ways to flee. Over in Proverbs 28, verse 1, it says, The wicked flee when there's no one pursuing, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. And we can flee in all kinds of ways, my friends. We can flee just by just trying to get away, physically trying to get away from circumstances. We can flee by running to alcoholism. We can flee by running to sexual immorality. We can flee just by reading books all the time. Now, that's not a bad thing unless it's to get away from our thoughts, you see. And it will eat us alive. So if we have that gunny sack, what do I do? Well, first, I have to be a believer. I have to be indwelled with the Spirit. I have to confess my sin. I have to go before the throne and I have to turn away from it and say, I am holding and harboring these unloving attitudes. Forgive me for that, Lord. But I have to count on the forgiveness that comes as a result of that. I have to say, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our sin from us. Amen? Amen. You are forgiven, my friends. Don't hold on to that saying, oh, I can't forgive that one. That's too bad. No, our God is stronger than that. Right? right. And then we surrender control to the Spirit. Ephesians 5.18 is a command. It's written in the imperative mood, present in perfect tense. It means a perpetual action. Be filled with the Spirit. In other words, be controlled by the Spirit. But we have to count on that control. You know, when it, back in 1 John, it tells us, if we make a request of the Lord, He will do it. If you say, Lord, fill me with your Spirit, will He not answer that prayer? My friends, as long as you and I are controlled by the Spirit, our responses to our circumstances will be love, no matter what. And it will keep our perspective on the, on the greater good, on the bigger plan, on God's master plan of sovereignty, and you and I have a part in that. What joy there is in that joy there is to have that, that peace, that joy, expressing a godly love to God and man. And so Joseph says, what you meant for evil, God meant for good, so that many would be saved. The next time the turn of events in your life go awry, the next time that they go perhaps not the way that you wanted them to go, remember, God is sovereign, and His purposes are the grand design to shape you in the likeness of the Son so that many would be saved. That's great. Father, thank you for your perfect purposes. Thank you for your word. Help us to trust the truth, Lord. Help us to grow in a deeper relationship with you, and in so doing, Lord, to respond to our circumstances with love more consistently, day by day. Thank you for the peace and joy that comes as a result of a vibrant relationship with you. Strengthen us. Be with us. Help us to honor you with, your, with our thoughts and to glorify you with our lives. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We come now to a time of invitation. And if you have never trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, now is the time for you to come forward and express that publicly. If you'd like to unite with this beautiful body of believers here and the loving 